that microphone pointed away. <laughs> is there another microphone that's, is that, that's off now? Okay. Oh, okay, that was on. Great. Uh, that was a, a, a fitting introduction to my talk, <laughs> um, which uh, uh, is about sort of uh, stewardship and, and, and what to do in our community. Um, as uh, as as uh, we uh, we deal with some of realities of, of life, um, so I I spoke yesterday and I think many of you were here, so I won't uh, do my my full intro again. But I'm executive director of the Software Freedom Conservancy, which is the nonprofit home of a lot of fantastic free open source software projects, and also the home of the Debian Copyright Aggregation Project. I'm a lawyer, but I only do uh, pro bono work now, which is volunteer work. Uh, and uh, my clients include the Free Software Foundation and the GNOME Foundation. Um, I co-organize Outreachy, which Debian participates in, which is an internship program for women and other underrepresented groups in free and open source software. Um, super into free software. Um, and I'm a cyborg uh, because I have a defibrillator that uh, has proprietary software in it that is literally sewn into my body and screwed into my heart and uh, for which I cannot review the source code, and it is insane. Um, these are, this is a slide with all of Conservancy's project, uh, many of which you're hopefully familiar with. Um, so the, obviously, first disclaimer uh, for, uh, for a talk like this is that while I am a lawyer, uh, this is not legal advice, and I am not your particular lawyer. Um, it's you'd be surprised how often people get confused about that. Um, and uh, I just wanted to point that out. Um, and it's my, my status as a cyborg has had me thinking a lot about issues um, around sort of making sure that initiatives survive beyond the individuals that started them and that communities are healthy and thrive. And it's been sort of interesting confronting my own mortality while being a part of such a cool and vibrant community that is developing and, uh, and, and aging, too. So the good news first, right? Like, happy birthday, Debian. <laughs> 23 years? Amazing. I think that's in, uh, in uh, April is the anniversary of the release. Um, how many people were, like, how many people remember the release of Debian? Okay, so two. How many? <laughs> how many people here are uh, younger than Debian? <laughs> more people here. So <laughs> more people here are younger uh, <laughs> Debian than remember Debian, which is amazing. Um, and, and just because we have a birthday cake up, how many people are celebrating their birthday or have celebrated their birthday here at DevConf? Let's just applaud these people. Hooray. <laughs> so uh, 23 years is a long time in my country. That means that Debian can drink and Debian can vote. <laughs> um, and uh, <laughs> and we're, we're uh, but the, the thing is we have people who have been involved in this project the whole time. And, um, and, and we as a community looking around are generally, well, no one is getting any younger, right? And um, with that comes a lot of considerations. And I know this is a really kind of heavy topic to have so early in the morning. So I have a small mechanism for dealing with this, which is baby penguins, okay? <laughs> We're gonna have some pictures of baby penguins as we talk about some of the more difficult uh, topics. Um, and, uh, and I thought penguins were appropriate because we can see them nearby, which is super cool. Um, so uh, the really serious topic is that we've already lost a lot of people who are important to us. Um, I may have missed some names. This is from uh, looking around the internet and um, some of the, the deaths have been more publicized than others and so I may be missing them, but I wanted to take a minute to remember the Debian contributors who um, are no longer with us, and I felt like uh, having a talk about what to do in the future is not complete without thinking about those who we uh, who are no longer here. Um, so uh, many of the the names on that list were people who who died quite young, um, 
and uh, we tragedy can happen to any of us at any time. It's just sort of the nature of life, and Debian is fortunate enough to be such a rich community with so many people that it's statistically going to happen um, at any point. But um, but we as a as a community and as a free software community have um, have been aging, and we see. Uh, overall, more gray hair, and and uh, we we have a hard time uh, finding people who have all of the T-shirts for all of the conferences from the previous years, and um, and it makes it a, a fun a, a, a fun challenge. But um, but there are a lot of things that I think we haven't thought about very deeply as a community, and we haven't figured out ways to um, to address them. The good news is that. We are already doing a lot of things right. Free software inherently is planning for the future because we're developing everything out in the open and there are good records and repositories for what we're doing. I think um, as we make sure that we have archival resources, um, and there's going to be an interesting talk about, uh, about that um, here, uh, an announcement around that. Um, I think that that's, that's part of it. But, um, but also the ways that we handle our community and invite newcomers in we have, uh, uh, you know, mechanisms for how we interact with each other. We've got discussion channels. Everything can be logged. And um, when somebody, uh, when somebody dies, it doesn't mean that their work dies with them because their work is a, a living part of, of Debian, a, a living part of our free software projects. So it's pretty cool because inherent in the way free software is operated is some mechanisms for making sure, to make sure that we can all work with each other, we're making sure that our, our, our legacy uh, is built in and that we can continue working with each other. Um, but, you know, sometimes things like, uh, things that we take for granted actually need some attention. So a lot of the, um, the legal mechanisms around free and open source software is copyright. Um, is there anyone here, and so, who here is this their first DevConf? Awesome. Cool. It's, uh, yay! <laughs> right. And how, how many people here, this is their first free software conference at all? So a couple of people, it's great. Um, uh, and does anyone here not know, uh, and it's totally understandable because this, you have to learn about this. How many people don't know about what copy left is? Does anyone not know what copy left is? Okay, so, uh, so copy left is a mechanism whereby we use copyright but for sharing. So free software is, is actually predicated on a legal framework. While it's all about the software, um, in order to make sure that we share software, we use copyright in order to share. And there are two major license styles. I'm gonna go super fast, sorry everybody. Uh, Two major license styles uh, to oversimplify everything. There's permissive licensing, which basically says you can do whatever you want with this license, and there's copyleft licensing, which says that um, you can do whatever you want with this license, provided that if you make modifications and distribute those changes, that you do so under the same license. So detractors have called it viral, but it's like a snowballing effect of forever free software that basically uh, 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 makes sure that the software is forever free. And, uh, and it's, it's, it's because of using these legal mechanisms that we are able to have this amazing, rich technological collaboration. And it's a really interesting legal hack. But it basically comes down to copyrights, no matter which kind of community that you're in, to have assurance that you can build on the software that you used before. You have to know that you have the permissions to use it and that those permissions are, um, are ones that, uh, that will survive uh, scrutiny. So. Um, sometimes it's simply not enough to know that the software has been licensed freely. Um, sometimes there are interesting things with licenses that happen. There's license compatibility. All of these are deep legal concepts that, concepts that uh, are, there are plenty of places to discuss online and, and get really deep into it. But there are, um, but there are some things that, um, there are times that you need to be sure that you have, um, you have the ability to review your licenses. So has anybody here been involved in a relicensing where a project had to relicense their, okay, so like, like a quarter of the group have been, how many people here choose not to license their code when they write it under um, an or later? So how many people here prefer to do like GPLv2 only 
or never to do or later. So, so you used to, right? So that's like a, maybe like an eighth of the audience um, won't do or later. How many people deliberately try to do or later? Um, so like, okay, like a third. Okay, so this is really interesting stuff, and you think that this stuff doesn't really make that much of a difference, but it turns out that if you if you choose a particular license that has no upgrade clause, and with uh, the GPL has no upgrade clause, and that means that the GPL when you choose GPL v2 or GPL v3 uh, or any of the GPL family licenses, there's no automatic like uh, if there's a later version of the license, it automatically uh, uh, gets upgraded to that license. Other licenses have that clause, but the GPL, none of the GPLs do. Um, and so this is resolved by having a, when people choose a license, they say GPL whatever or later, and that's kind of like meta licensing. This is all like a, God, you guys are all licensing experts coming out of this. <laughs> um, but uh, but uh, so what happens is that if you've chosen a particular license and there's no um, upgrade clause, or if there's some reason that a license is incompatible with other software that it needs to be combined with, um, you could be in a situation where you need to do a relicensing. You can do a relicensing provided that all the people who hold the copyright are available to relicense it. And so I have been involved, more baby penguins, I have been involved in a couple of relicensings where a number of the contributors had died. And I was in the situation where I was talking to the um, surviving spouse um, in three occasions to explain to them why we needed to do a relicensing, uh, what, like, what, why it was important, what the, what copyrights were, and why the person's spouse had taken so much time to contribute to free and open source software and what we were trying to accomplish overall. And in two of those situations, I was successful. You know, I was able to explain, this is what free software is. It's really cool. Your spouse cared deeply about what we were working on together and um, wanted, you know, this, this is a, a really cool legacy that, uh, you know, that this person had. And by relicensing it, it means that their software will be included in software, you know, in, in the ultimate product, even though there's a relicensing and even though um, this person is no longer alive and contributing to the project. But in one situation, I couldn't convince the spouse. The, the spouse said, well, you know, he wanted me, he wanted to provide for me in this instance. Uh, you know, he wanted to provide for me and so and so I know that he wouldn't want me to relicense it because he would have wanted you to pay me. And I said, well, he was contributing his software to this community because he cared about it and it, it's, it's world-changing software. And she said, well, if it weren't important for me to be relicensing it, you wouldn't have called me and you wouldn't have gotten in touch. And obviously it's extremely important to you and therefore you should pay me. And I went again and said, and, 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 and in the end, I was not able to convince her, and we had to write that software out of the, the project, which surely wasn't the right result, and I, I couldn't figure out how best to explain it. And at the end of the day, you know, we did the best that we could, but she wasn't involved in our community, and she didn't, under, she, she, she didn't understand the goals that we were trying to accomplish and I, I failed to explain it in a way that was convincing to her. And I think that probably is not that unusual. That I think that maybe most of the time, significant others, spouses will understand what the, um, what the, the goals are of free software because we spend so much of our time doing it that we talk about it. But sometimes it simply doesn't, um, you know, it, not everybody shares the same understanding or the same values. Um, and there are surely not, there are surely issues that we haven't anticipated. So there are a lot of reasons why we might want to relicense, whether it's because we're using different software that we hadn't anticipated and combining it from uh, one project with, uh, with incompatible licensing terms to another. But there are surely things that are down the road that we don't even know are going to happen. The laws are changing rapidly. I mean, we live in a world where we could wake up one morning and 
uh, the UK is leaving the European Union. <laughs> You know, like, and, and, and we'll have a lot of work to do on determining their, um, you know, how uh, their intellectual property regime shakes out from all of this. There's a lot, there are a lot of areas that could change. There could be, um, you know, new laws in places where we're, uh, we're already familiar with how things work, or we could wind up having uh, countries become much more critical, like much more involved in free software higher percentages of population from places where there are laws that we're not even that familiar with that turn out to be obstacles to participating together. There are a lot of reasons why we might need to have mechanisms over the control of our copyrights and our code that we haven't even thought of. And I think what, as, as time goes, I think it's amazing to me, um, you know, I, I still feel kind of like a newcomer, um, but I've been around lo certainly long enough to see that already there have been some major changes, but it's amazing to me how the legal structures have held up and how our basic presumptions about how free software works and how we operate together have in fact um, you know, played out and continued. Um, so one of the things that, uh, that, that companies have said they needed to, to handle this was, uh, was CLAs or copyright assignment or copyright licensing agreements. And I, I was on a panel at the desktop summit uh, in 2011 I had just become executive director of GNOME, um, and uh, that's Mark Shuttleworth there, uh, sort of introducing some of the ideas around why Canonical wanted copyright assignment, um, and that's uh, uh, Bradley Kuhn and Michael Meeks who were there uh, basically teaming up and saying, we won't have copyright assignment, we won't have CLAs. But, uh, but what was amazing is that following that panel, there was like a, a, a huge outpouring of vitriol for copyright license agreements and copyright assignment agreements. Um, and the reasons why there were those reactions was because the idea that, um, that a company should be a steward of the license was sort of, you know, people didn't, didn't like the idea that a single company could be um, in, in so much control over um, over free software and choose how to relicense it. Um, so, uh, so in a world where we don't want our companies to be the, the sole uh, steward of what we get to do in the future and how we relicense it, it comes back to us as individuals. So um, one of the things that I, so I, when I was a, 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 a new lawyer in the field in, uh, I guess it was already, it was 2006, um, I was I, I came I saw this problem immediately and I thought ah oh, this is so easy I'm going to write a white paper to like this week with like language that we could put into people's wills and then developers can basically handle this all with no problem like the, there will be no problem at all they'll just put I'll, I'll get some magic language and I'll publish it and you can put it in your will and you can bequeath the, your copyrights to the Free Software Foundation or wherever you thought that your copyright should go, whatever entity that you trust. But I called a trust and estates lawyer and, um, and she started to laugh. <laughs> and she said, well, I don't know. I mean, I'm just a trust and estates lawyer in New York, but that, that's not really going to work. You know that. And I was like, I don't know. That, that, that's not going to work. So I, I, I called... Uh, I, I called trust and estates lawyers in, in other major jurisdictions in the United States. Like, in, this is all state by state in the U.S. So I called a you know trust and estates lawyer in Oregon and in uh, in Massachusetts. You know the places where a lot of free software people live. And the answers were mixed. But at the end of the day, it's clear that it's not a silver bullet that you can simply bequeath your copyrights to someone and have that work out. It uh, what happens is that there's a chance that the copyrights so that the will will be probated and probated is basically reviewed by a judge like the 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 that will have to go through legal mechanisms in order to to test its validity and determine how it needs to be um, implemented and uh, and if the will is probated there's a chance that there could be taxes levied on the copyrights that are bequeathed so it's possible that if you if you just like Care, like sort of say in your will, I want my copyrights to go to the Free Software Foundation, then there's a chance that while the Free Software Foundation may be the right place for it, that and, and everybody wants your 
copyrights to go to the Free Software Foundation. I keep gesturing to John, uh, who's sitting right there. Um, but uh, but wh while that might be the right thing to do, if there are taxes levied, it could come out of the money that the estate had. So that means that whatever money you had when you died could be reduced by a portion for taxes just for copyrights that are valuable because they're part of a free and open source software project, but that you would never even consider selling. And you know, so it's a it's this strange situation where um, where bequeathment simply won't won't do the trick because otherwise oh, I needed some baby penguins here where we thought about the fact that uh, the money that we left behind for our loved ones might be reduced um, by taxes simply because we used a clumsy mechanism. Um, and when you think about all of this, it's, you start thinking, well, you know, even, even if I could, even if, so even if I can't bequeath it, well then, what happens to my copyrights if I do nothing? And the answer is generally that it goes along the same, the same pathways to our next of kin. So if you do nothing with your copyrights, that means that when you die, it will flow through the ordinary course um, also, there may be taxes, but uh, but if you putting that issue aside, um, thinking about who who would be the next recipient of copyright. So I, I you know when uh, when I was originally talking and thinking about um, copyright license agreements and assignment agreements, uh, the the sheer vitriol for them. I was trying to get a handle on it and why people didn't. How many people here have a strong feeling they never want to assign their copyrights to anyone, ever? OK, so not that many people, just the four people in the audience. Um, I've, I've experienced that in, in, in many, many more numbers than that, where people have no doubt. And I sort of go, go back to them and say, well, you know, who will inherit the copyrights and do they understand it? And one friend of mine, um, uh, who's a Debian developer, had never thought about this before. And I said, well, does your mo mother understand free and open source software? And normally, I avoid trying to say uh, mother or grandmother because they're, you know, people never. But, but in this case, this particular case, it was his, his mother is his next of kin. And I said, does your mother understand uh, free and open source software? And while she's an extremely smart lady, she doesn't. She's not, not really had that much experience, and because of their relationship, they don't really talk about, like, have you talked to your parents about free software? <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but, but they hadn't had occasion to talk about it, and his mother would be the one who would receive the copyrights in the instance that anything happened to him. And where many of us are, are working on really critical pieces of free and open source software, where that copyright could transfer to someone who doesn't have the, the background, doesn't have the experience, doesn't have the interest, and doesn't have the knowledge, it really puts, it, it could potentially put a progress, a project at risk. So part of this is okay, because you can assign today with no problem. You know, if I were a, 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 perhaps a, a better salesman, I would say, and this is why you need to assign your copyrights to the Debian Cover Aggregation Project with Conservancy. <laughs> but, uh, but that's simply an, an oversimplification. And what we're looking for here is the best solution for free software and for Debian uh, and making sure that we choose the right mechanisms overall. But what's interesting about the fact that you can assign today with no problem is that it, you don't have issues around, like they call it consideration, making sure that the contract is valid. It's pretty much understood in, all, in every jurisdiction that I have researched that there's a way to do it today. You may have to um, figure out a way to deal with moral rights depending on where you are, but we pretty much understand that that will is very likely to be upheld, and you can assign it today. But most people, many people, don't want to assign it today. And so I've been noodling around in a lot of these questions because for for like a decade, because what we need is something like perpetual care for copyrights, right? We need something like you know perpetual care is when if you, and I, I hope that most of you have not had this experience before, but when you. Uh, uh, bury somebody in a cemetery. I need another baby penguin, and I don't have one here. Um, <laughs> when you bury someone, um, you, can, you, can, you can purchase what they call perpetual care. So they do plantings, and they agree that they will continue to maintain the gravesite and, um, and water the plants. And you can buy this for yourself. It's there. You can do like what is like a living will. And I, I highly recommend everybody to think hard about their, um, what they want to happen 
when they die because it's like one of the best gifts you can give to the people you love to already have arranged these things before um, you, um, you know, before before you you die, and these people are left in a situation where where the people you love are left with a situation where they're they're dealing with the shock and the grieving that you've died, but then they also have to make all these decisions and figure out what you wanted and what you didn't want. We need more baby penguins. But um, but instead of thinking of it as perpetual care and thinking of it in terms of funerals, we can instead think of it in terms of potatoes. <laughs> because because <laughs> because because really copyrights are not are not things that we don't need a mausoleum for our copyrights, right? What's cool about our free software copyrights is that the hope is it will only be a problem if they continue to be useful, right? If they're going to continue to be used. And so what I love about this is that is that each of those potatoes is has the potential or is sprouting, right? And ideally if we write code that is great and useful, it'll be used again and again in a number of different ways. And what we need is, is, is a way to handle these copyrights that's a, a way to, to help them uh, living and vibrant. Um, and so the copyright aggregation project that we put together handles this in part, right? It handles it for people who want this, who don't want to think about this now. So if you want to just never think about your copyrights again, you can assign to something like the, the Debian Copyright Aggregation Project. And Bradley's going to do a whole talk on that on Thursday, so you can go uh, check that out if, uh, if you're interested, and we'll have agreements and all of that stuff. Um, but if you want to, um, if you, if, and, and that's perfect, especially if you are interested in having your copyrights enforced or having Debian, some copyrights in Debian enforced, um, and not having to, um, and, and having whatever involvement you want in that process. Uh, but if you want to be a part of a group effort to do that, um, but that is that's a, a problem. That's a solution for now, and so I've been kind of thinking about what to do for the future. And um, and it finally, like a year ago, I had this lightning bolt that we need a trust. And I am so legally geeky that this is like I was like a trust. We can have a trust. Oh my God! Finally, we can solve this. And I was like running around. We could do this, right? You know. And it's uh, and so uh, I, I and so what we can do is we could set up a trust so that we assign today. So so you want to. So many people want to keep some of the rights. They don't want to um, assign their their copyrights because they want to keep some control. For some people, that means the ability to control um, enforcement, and they definitely don't want to. Win trust anybody else to go anywhere near enforcing their copyrights. For some people, it's just the idea that they want to hold their copyrights, and it's a, it's a principled, conceptual thing. And so uh, with this idea, you could assign it today, but you get a grant back of all or, or some of the rights, which are all of the things that you really care about. So basically, you could put your copyright in a trust today so that um, is physically, like it's, it's not physically, but it's, it's legally held by a trust, and then they, the trust then grants back to you the right to um, enforce in some circumstances, or your right to, you could relicense, you could sublicense it, so you could license it under something else. A lot of times that's not particularly meaningful because you, uh, you, the software is part of a project that has a particular license, but the idea that you could sublicense it, you could, you could do that, and you could have all the rights that you would have had if you kept the copyrights that you care about, but then the copyrights are held by the trust, and when you die, that grant expires. So it's like this like, kind of springing mechanism, even though it's not actually a springing mechanism. Um, and I got really excited about this, and I think that, um, that it really has a chance of working. And I'm mentioning this half-baked idea to you now, I'll tell you uh, uh, at this point, because I think that this is the kind of thing that can't be solved by some external legal entity all of a sudden. This, can't, this isn't a project that can be taken on, taken on um, you know, by me alone and offered as an option. It's something that we need to design with, uh, with everybody's input. And I think that uh, it could be relevant for Debian and every other free software project. But Debian is the, you know, is, is such an important leader in the in thought for free and open source software, and so I'm going to continue to develop, like telling you where this idea goes, um, and think about it, and tell me what you think, how we, how it, the idea could be improved, and then also where it could possibly be funded. <laughs> um, but what's cool about this idea is that if we have a trust that's holding the copyrights, and it's a um, 
and we're we're doing the 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 license back and that expires when you die and then the, the trust holds it is that you could have a checklist of things that you think are okay for to be done with your copyrights going forward. So you could say for example that I I'm okay with the trust relicensing it so long as it's relicensed under copyleft. I'm okay with it relicensing so long as it's under only a lax permissive license. Um, I'm okay if it's Relicensed by any license that under any license that's stewarded by the Free Software Foundation um, or or another entity that you particularly trust, and um, or I only want it to be relicensed for a change in the law. So it's cool because we could do like a Creative Commons style simplified checklist of what you're okay with being done with your software going forward, um, and I think that that's. But then if we do that. We also have this really cool opportunity for a registry for free and open source software. So in order to assign your copyrights to this, obviously the trust will have to maintain contact information for everybody and, um, and keep track of, of, uh, of what they hold in the trust, which means they'll have the infrastructure for a registry. And one of the things that we've had a problem with or that we've come across with in outreachy uh, and bringing in um, uh, people from diverse backgrounds is that not everybody wants to be identified. I mean, how many people here um, are reluctant to put their real name uh, in a on a public uh, in any public place. So like yeah, like uh, quite a number of people, and there are probably people who didn't want to identify themselves. <laughs> <laughs> so what you could do with the trust with this particular idea is that they the trust could hold up. You could re register a handle and have it in one place, or or two handles or three handles, and then you have the um, the benefits of anonymity while having the legal structures in place so that there's not the danger of having copyrights that can't be tracked and can't be um, and, and aren't looked for. Um, and also it helps people who have reason to change their name so that they can contact it in one place. With the relicensings that I have done, um, there have always been pieces of software that you couldn't, um, that we couldn't relicense because we never got, we were just simply were never able to get in touch with the person again because they were using an old email address. So here you would only need to keep your address up to date with one particular entity. And then I got all thinking, what's even cooler about it is that it might not have to be just for individuals. So if companies did this, we could have the same kind of springing arrangement where copyrights could, uh, where companies could um, put their copyrights in a trust and get all the rights granted back to them, but that could terminate upon, for example, an acquisition or some kind of change in policy. If a company, it could be whatever the company wants to do in terms of showing its good will to the environment. So for example, if it files for, you know, if it, if it prosecutes a patent. So it's a really interesting legal mechanism. I'm, I'm almost done actually, and then we can open it up for questions. Um, and so, um, this whole, so there's a lot of possibilities with this, and I think that uh, that I have to admit that it's totally vaporware. <laughs> I've been working on this for a very long time, but there's nothing, there's no there there. We don't. Uh, I think that once we design it, it'll be very easy to put it in place legally. But if we put something in place to care for our copyrights and stewardship of of our projects for. If we, if we put a project like this in place, we need to make sure it's right. We need to make sure it's really right. And we need to make sure we have the right public mechanisms for talking about whether this is the trusted entity that everybody can believe in or not. We need to design its governance. It's a huge project um, and one that is uncomfortable because we absolutely have to talk about the fact that we are all going to die. It's, the, it's, it's easier, baby penguins. It's easier for me, you know, it's like sort of, it's been easy for, it's been hard, well, it's been, I, I've been thinking about these issues in part because of being public and talking about the fact that I have a heart condition, um, which is something I would never have liked to do if I, and I would never do it if I didn't think that it would explain software freedom so well. But having so many people say to me, oh, that's so horrible for you. <laughs> like, are you, are you gonna die soon? <laughs> um, and so it sort of made me think a lot about these issues and how, um, you know, and, and how we are simply, while we're really good planners in free and open source software, we're not confronting these issues around the legal mechanisms and the fact that, uh, that we're going to have a big changeover um, at some point soon. And in the meantime, we have to continue doing all the things that we're, we're doing to tend to our social structure and expect turnover in our, 
in our participation for all kinds of reasons, including death. Um, so in the meantime, the fact that uh, Debian participates in Summer of Code, and how many people here are, uh, are, are Summer of Code graduates and outreachy graduates? So yeah, or participants? Or participants, participants is good, and yeah. <laughs> so a, a lot of people, and it's we, finding ways to get um, to get new people involved is going to be a really important uh, part of the social mechanisms of staying vibrant um, and staying relevant, and also um, continuing to talk about our ideals and of freedom and not taking um, those things for granted. And then also, there's a lot of opportunity with age. Um, aside from all of the, the cliche things about the experience that one gets with age, which is surely true, um, there are, is anyone here willing to admit that they're thinking about retiring? Like, or, yeah, so like quite, <laughs> actually quite a number of people in the audience, right, are thinking about retiring. And so there's tremendous opportunity because, you know, like, free software is so much fun. And so when people retire who are free software people, they're probably going to write a lot of code. Like there's going to be a really cool opportunity if we make it, if we continue to make it fun and are, are, are excited to get people who are retiring into our communities. They might contribute a tremendous amount. Um, and like keep rocking DevConf, like having a conference where people are really excited to come, where they'll travel all the way to whatever location that uh, DevConf is hosted in is a really important part of maintaining culture and um, passing on the ideals so that the uh, project continues to be vibrant. Um, and that's the end of the proper talk. I should mention that Conservancy is having a fundraiser here. <laughs> and we're, we have a matching, uh, anonymous donor has generously agreed to match donations for DevConf attendees. So if you, uh, if you donate and indicate that you uh, signed up at DevConf, it will, will get double, which is really, really cool. Um, so thank you very much. And I think I have like a few minutes for questions. And there was a question back there. James. Hey. Uh, thanks for your talk. Uh, just a question from the corporate side of view. Uh, not speaking for my employer. What? I'm afraid of the microphone. Uh, so the question is, again, not for my employer, just in general. Um, trying to understand like corporate law, which I'm quite new to, um, wouldn't it be sort of fiscally irresponsible and thus open a company to liability, especially if they're publicly traded, if they had some sort of contract or clause that automatically transfers away their copyrights on bankruptcy or acquisition or so on? You know, it depends on, it, it, it sort of depends on how they're structured and what their plans are and what the project, like what the product is. If there's a business case that the, um, that the, uh, product will be more successful if they're, you know, for example, if you're building a product from a, pro a product that relies on free software from the beginning, and you believe that you will get a lot of an investment, a lot of successful external R and D, if you'll get a lot of benefit and a lot of buy-in, um, and it's a product where um, where collaboration is essential, and uh, then then you can sort of set these things up in the in a similar way. It's a, it's part of the overall risk analysis for the company. It's just like um, your question is very similar to uh, questions that were surely asked originally about free software licenses to begin with. Isn't it uh, irresponsible in opening a company up to liability to uh, to grant a sharing license over our software? So it's sort of uh, companies will have to come and it, and I, it's sort of a tiny bit of a flight of fancy because I don't think that I think it will be somewhat unusual at least initially for a public company um, that's a large company in our space to jump into this. Um, and, you know, but I think that especially for small companies starting out or for new um, products, especially for um, free software projects that are collaboration efforts, that it's a demonstration of good faith um, to, to do this. And provided that all of the rights that are necessary in order to protect the company's interests are built into it, it I think it should be possible. I, I guess I think it's a good idea. I'm just saying that I think companies are very risk averse, and even getting companies to copy left has turned out to be quite difficult. So this might even be even insurmountable in, in many cases. It might be, but um, but I would say that people definitely thought that copy left was insurmountable, and uh, pretty much they're all using the Linux kernel. So it's that it's it's all a risk analysis. If the com so as per my talk yesterday, if the com if companies can convince the 
can convince everybody that permissive licensing, that whatever holds the most rights for them is best for, uh, it works, then they'll, they'll, you know, they'll take advantage of that if we can convince them that there's an advantage to, um, to uh, participating in something like this, just like it, there's an advantage in participating in the Linux kernel. Um, I believe they might do it, um, especially for, um, for new initiatives. I think that it could be a, um, a very innovative show of good faith. So, hi, Sam Harbin. Um, first of all, this is really interesting stuff, and thank you for presenting it. Um, so, I'd like to ask you to consider something when, when developing this trust. I'm, as I've been thinking about what I would like to happen to a lot of my stuff, you know, when I'm no longer in a position to make decisions, whether I'm dead or simply incapacitated. Um, at least in American jurisprudence, um, the copyright was supposed to be a limited time right that you know, um, in exchange for this limited time monopoly, you're more willing to share your stuff, um, you know, maybe by selling it or whatever. Yeah. Um, and you know, for a variety of reasons, copyright has gotten to be a fairly long-lived right. Um, I I think that behind being able to have an option like where, um, you know, the say some number of years after my death, like order of five as opposed to, what is it, 75? No, it's like <laughs> ridiculously long. Um, now, the, May the as well be forever, is um, what I feel. <laughs> well, yeah, but I mean, it's not officially forever. Oh, yet. no, no, no. I'm but, but you, you know, I mean, we've seen the Supreme Court case, you know, but um, where effectively a few, a few years after my death, basically things were licensed under the most permissive license as possible, effectively as if there was, the copyright had expired. Um, mm -hmm. I at least would find that sort of option very appealing because I think that there's a balancing act between grabbing power, and copyright is a form of power, um, and also accepting that I don't want to control the future, that I want to let the future do its own thing. Yeah, uh, I think that's absolutely, I 100% agree with everything you said, and that's one of the things that we could do with the, with the yeah. trust is we could have a, an automatic, like a, an option to have your works license under CC0, which is yeah. effectively um, as close to the public domain as we can get in many jurisdictions. Um, so, yeah. So I think we just have some time for some more questions because there's no talk directly afterwards. And if anybody feels like they need to get coffee because it's early, feel free. I can't hear you. My job to do this right. <laughs> okay, this comes from uh, Jatan. What might be some so, uh, some reasons why people involved in free software projects not want to license their code with GPL despite its social virtues? Wait, uh, sorry, I missed the bat, the. the uh, why people involved in free software projects do not want to license their code uh, with GPL despite its social despite virtues. Its social virtues. Why don't people want to license under? Whoa, uh, I can't possibly understand why anyone wouldn't want to license. <laughs> no, I'm um, actually. I should say, Conservancy is license agnostic. We have projects that are permissively, like permissively licensed, and we have projects that are uh, are. Our copy, strong copy left, and want to uh, want to enforce those licenses. So, from Conservancy's perspective, it's uh, very neutral. For me, I'll tell you that I started out being also very license agnostic, and part of it was that I had a lot of clients who were part of permissively licensed projects where they really felt, you know, I mean, I, I was counsel to a couple of the BSDs originally, like felt passionately that it was a different kind of freedom. And you know that, that that it was you know free if you imposed restrictions. Um, but now I've sort of you know and and that the GPL was a form of restriction. But as time has passed and I have understood sort of and I've gone through my own personal um, struggling with not having the source code to my defibrillator and connecting my reliance on that software to um, to our use of software and the fact that we don't even know what software we're going to be relying on, I have come over strongly to the GPL camp, and, and I think that 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 I think that once you realize that if you don't have the um, the access to the to the complete and corresponding source code and the scripts for installation, which is those are like the words from, but if you don't, you're not going to be able to deal with a security problem, and so. 
you're you're not you're not necessarily but anyway so you nobody here needs me to convince them about the virtues of copy left but i think that a lot of people don't really understand the long term implications of the of these licensing choices and we're going to need some failures unfortunately and more baby penguins somewhere but we really need failures in order for people to understand why copy left is so important and we're going to need what's happening is that is that we're already starting to see some of the some problems from the fragmentation around some of the permissively licensed projects and developers will be frustrated that they no longer have access to the the projects effectively that they were a major part of earlier because it's gone off in a proprietary fork and so I think that, that there are a lot of reasons why people choose um, permissively licensed projects. I have to say I don't understand why, why, there's, why the folks that have vitriol for CopyLeft have vitriol for I think that is simply not thinking, I think that to me that's not really thinking that deeply about the project. If you make a choice because you've thought reasonably about these different licenses and you choose uh, one thing or another, that's totally fine, but the, the hate that ha had been exhibited for the GPL I, I, I think it probably means that we need to talk more about, in a calm way, about why copyleft is so important. And it's not about polarizing personalities. <coughs> it's not about um, tribe. It's about uh, a license choice. I can give you an answer to hate that. You what? No. Sam? <coughs> so this is from a purely, um, and, and from a purely, uh, uh, human reaction standpoint. It is frustrating um, to be forced into a decision. Um, and basically, G the GPL is all about um, creating incentives that are so strong that um, that you, you will choose, that, you know, that in some cases there have been people who have had to use the GPL because the, there was a large enough commons, and that's in a specific design goal of the GPL to create that commons. And feeling like you were powerless, feeling like despite the fact that you would really like to do something else, that some other entity is forcing you into a decision, which is what a commons does, which is what a commons like the GPL does, can be a very, um, a very emotionally negative experience. Um, on the other, I, I, and I, I, I do understand the other, the flip side of that. But I, I mean, that kind of force, when it's applied to you, is is something that may get a really strong negative reaction. Mm -hmm. uh, people, uh, I know this this topic can go on for a very long time. <laughs> we have uh, lots of things to to ask, and I'm sure this can, uh, with this community, this can lead to a, a endless debate, uh, which will be very productive. But uh, well, Karen's still here. Uh, we could maybe do a buff on another day if people are interested. Yeah, so, so please, we, we we are over time already, so oh, okay. I have to cut this uh, session short. And uh, well, thank you very much. Was, uh, thank you. All.